Our anchor verse for week four of Custom Fit is found in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17. I'm going to read out the Amplified. I just love the way this reads. It's on the screens. It says, no weapon that is formed against you will succeed. And every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, you will condemn. This peace, righteousness, security, and triumph over opposition is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. This is their vindication from me, says the Lord. During this entire series, we've been talking about putting on the full armor of God, not just bits and pieces, but the full armor of God. So when the enemy tries to mess with your peace, when the enemy tries to mess with your hope, when he tries to distract your heart or your mind, you can rock with confidence the full armor of God. I'm gonna date myself for just a moment. I'm really hoping that somebody brings this back. But I remember when I got that pullover starter jacket. Y'all remember that back in the day? With the Velcro flap in the front? You had to be careful where you wore it so you didn't get in a fight. Y'all remember those? Those were next level. I've been trying to find a vintage one. And I remember my friends at high school would be like, dang, you got the Chicago Bulls one. So if you had the Oakland Raiders one, like, you, woo, like, you were tough, amen. But I remember friends would be like, bro, that is fire. Where did you get it? And I remember my response was, my dad bought me this outfit. So for week number four, the title of today's sermon, because of the armor of God provided by God our Father, the title of week four is thanks. My dad bought me this outfit. <laughs> Says the series. I like it. Okay, let's pray. Father, give us ears to hear you, a mind to understand as we talk about the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit today. And God, most importantly, we need a heart ready to receive. In our hearts, everything flows from it. That's why you tell us and instruct us to guard our heart above all else. So God, I pray today that you would give us a heart ready to receive, if you're ready to receive. Shout amen. amen. So the past few weeks, we've been unpacking these six pieces of the armor of God that make up the full armor of God. And when it comes to the armor of God, we believe that the armor has an answer. This is a verse that is the core foundational verse in the entire series, Ephesians chapter six, verses 10 through 17. Paul writes this either from a house arrest position or in prison. He writes it from the perspective of recognizing and understanding the Roman guard that was protecting him. And the Lord downloaded to him the spiritual armor that we have access to as the children of God. And this is what it says. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Some of y'all are like, thank God for guardians of the galaxy. All right, verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. It doesn't say, hey, I kind of suggest you do this. No, it's a declarative statement. Y'all, we live in a fallen world where there's lots of distractions and things trying to throw you off the path that God has for you. So put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, because it will, wave at me if you've gone through some stuff, come on. And if you haven't yet, you haven't lived. And if you haven't lifted your hand, you're lying. We'll do an altar call for you at the end. <laughs> no, the day of evil will come. So he says, the day of evil will come so you will be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, verse 14, he says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, the feet fitted with the readiness, readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith for which it will extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Put on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So today, again, for the last two pieces of the armor, we're gonna be unpacking the helmet of salvation and how we need to wear it every day to guard against the lies, the deception and the tricks and schemes of the enemy. And we're also gonna break down and unpack the sword of the spirit. When I think of the armor, I think of clothing. I think of uh, something that we should wear every day. When I think of clothing, I think of one of life's greatest questions. Is it appropriate to wear a Snuggie like a shirt to Walmart? Has anybody ever, does anybody own a Snuggie? Let's just talk about that for a minute. You, who doesn't know what a Snuggie is? Okay, it's a phenomenal invention. It's 90% comfortable, 10% practical, and 100% ridiculous. It's a blanket with sleeves. It's kind of up there with sham wow and pet rocks. You can whip up eggs, make a latte. 
didn't use restroom. I mean, it's, it's a handy, but people wear these things out. Like it's something that, it, you know, just like a daily fashionable clothing choice. Um, now, I'm a throw guy. I don't like Snuggies. I like, how many of y'all like throws? Like you like big blankets? Like I just, I like it. And so my wife, how, how many of y'all have gotten into the weighted blankets? We've talked about this before. Y'all, these weighted blankets, they come in various weights. Some of y'all are like, I thought we were gonna be looking at the Bible. Just give me a second. They come in different weights. My wife bought the heavier ones so she can throw two of them on me. I'm stuck there for hours. Like... But back to Snuggies for a minute. The Bible, the word of God that describes the word as the sword of the spirit, it's, it's not the snuggie of the spirit. It's not just something that we wrap ourselves up in because we want to have something comfortable. Now, don't get me wrong. It's comforting. It provides peace, but it's also a weapon. It's also a weapon that we use to drive back the devices of the enemy. And a lot of times we approach the word of God like, when I read it, I want it to be comfortable. I need it to be practical. I don't want it to be too ridiculous. It's not the snuggie of the spirit. We're talking about the sword. It's a weapon that goes against the craziness of the enemy because the Bible says that the spirit realm is even more real than the natural realm we live in. Now, we understand what we, our senses, what we smell, what we touch, what we see, what we hear, we feel. But man, the spirit realm, there's a real enemy who really doesn't like you, who wants to really throw your life in a tailspin to rob you of your best life, not only cripple you of what God wants to do through you, but rip off all the people connected to your purpose. So we're gonna talk about the importance of the sword of the spirit, yes, bringing comfort, but we're gonna also talk about how it's the only piece of armor that's off, it's offensive. It's offensive and defensive, but typically Christians We turn to the Bible because we need comfort, which is a good thing. A lot of times, statistically, we turn to the Bible when we're in a bind. And so as we look through these verses, they will bring comfort. They will bring peace. There's also something that God has instructed us to do. He's called us to take territory. He's called us to push back against the the, the tricks of the enemy. I, I was in Dallas and there's this father in the faith who's been in ministry longer than I've been alive. And he had like a Q and A session and people were asking like, interesting questions. And so they got to me and I said, when does the day of opposition stop? And I knew the answer. I just kind of wanted him to be like, brother, let me tell you. But instead he said, for you, never. I said, good, good. This was worth the trip. I'm glad you. He said, no, the reason why opposition will never stop for you is because when you wake up, you're a threat to the enemy every day. When you wake up, your goal is to take territory for the kingdom every day. So there's a bullseye on your back. There's a bullseye on Hope City. Why? Because y'all are looking at taking territory for the kingdom and pushing back against the kingdom of darkness. Come on, where's some big faith, audacious faith believers that want to take territory? Some of y'all are like, is that even the Bible? I'm glad you asked. First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10, a man named Jabez prays, Oh, that you would indeed bless me and enlarge my territory, that you would enlarge my border, that you would give me more territory, more property, and that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil so that it does not hurt me. And this line right here blesses me because if he did it for Jabez, he can do it for you, and God granted his request. Say that out loud, and God is granting my request. And this is so important. God granted his request, but this part about evil, I wanna focus on for a minute because when we're wearing the armor of God, students, let me talk to you real quick. As you're stepping back into this school year, teachers, faculty, as you guys are stepping in to this school year, don't walk out of your house without putting on the armor of God. Every single day. We live in a fallen world where the belt of truth is keeping us in a posture that says, ah, yeah, I know they're saying this is normal. I know they're saying this is okay, but the truth of the word says this. Because I've said this before, we're getting comfortable sitting around tables Jesus would want to flip over. And when we're wearing the armor of God, it locks in the truth. When you're wearing the breastplate of righteousness, it guards your heart. When you're wearing the helmet of salvation, it guards your mind. When you're wearing the feet of peace, it causes you to walk in a spirit of rest. So when you walk into a room, you're not affected by peer pressure, students. You are peer pressure. Your friends are like, what is she doing? Where is she going? Why is he not cussing and joking like everybody else? Because you change the atmosphere. When you walk into a room, ask for somebody. The word of God 
specifically the armor of God, it's a stabilizer. I'm gonna do an illustration. I did it the first service, and I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna give it a go again. So uh, I've got this illustration, and let's just act like this thing right here. Thank you so much. Come on, give our team a hand. They're amazing. So this is a, a stabilizer. Now, this little guy right here, if we can just get, I'll have you zoom in on him. He's a, he's a little guy. I'm gonna call him uh, Willy Wonky. That's what I'm gonna call him. He's trying to ride a unicycle. Now, he's trying to balance life. He's trying to balance uh, carnality and hanging out with the <laughs> wrong crowd, and he's also you know, put on his church clothes. And so this is his life, but without the stabilizer, with him trying to do things on his own, it, it never works. No matter how hard I try to make it happen, it falls over because he needs a stabilizer. So he puts on the armor of God, he's walking with the Lord, and as he is stabilizing his life, well then what happens is he's at the club on Friday and then church on Sunday. And he's trying to balance life and he's like, but I need a word from the Lord. And so he has a, a prophecy on Sunday, but he, he read on social media that there's half off psychic uh, ads on Tuesday. <laughs> and he's hit by life and because he's not fully wearing the armor of God consistently or he's picked and choose what he wants when life hits him, it puts him in a little bit of a tailspin. How many of y'all have ever lived like this? where you're trying to balance, hide, compartmentalize sin and the weight of life, but then you show up and you're like, hey, brother blessed. I'm doing really good. Sister saved, we're amazing. Have you read the Bible lately? B-I-B-L-E, it is the book for me. And we end up trying to figure out how to balance it. God never designed you to try to balance it. He actually asked us to cast our care on him. So when we walk and we live in the armor of God, Proverbs 16, 9 says, in their hearts, humans, that's us, say that's me, determine their course, but it's the Lord that establishes their steps. You have to have a stabilizer in your life. It all belongs to him anyways. So when life throws storms at you and starts putting you in a tailspin, we have access to the hand of God that says, hey, 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 I'm gonna stabilize you. Cast these cares on me. Don't try to wear this weight on your own, and he balances us in life. Come on, let's give Willy Wonky a hand. I hope that helps somebody. Y'all are amazing. <laughs> because what happens is this sort of balancing act, I can speak from this personally. As I was growing up, trying to figure out how to bet on me, but also trust God wholeheartedly, that sort of balancing act will leave you feeling empty and depleted. I don't know about you. How many of y'all have ever tried to go your own path and do it in your own strength? Come on, 47 of you. Amen. <laughs> now, the truth is, what ends up coming at us and what we end up kind of dealing with, because seeds you sow today, you will live in the harvest of tomorrow, whether they're good or bad. So let's not, look at the person next to you and say, don't be like Willy Wonky. Come on, don't be like that guy. Okay, so focusing... <laughs> Focusing on the last two pieces of armor this weekend. Number one, if you're taking down notes, write this down. Number one, don't forget your helmet. Don't forget your helmet. My daughter, Finley, she, we call her the heat. She's fearless. She's an adventurer. She was like, if I can stand on this monitor, I think I can get to the second row from here. And she would try to jump. Like, she's, she's wild. And so anyway, she'll want to go out and ride her skateboard. And I'll say, hey, hey, put on your knee pads. Put on your elbow pads. And don't forget your helmet. Now, last week, Pastor Jackie threw up a picture of what Roman soldiers probably looked like. I don't know where she got it. It was like a, I don't know, five below Dollar Tree outfits. Um, but what we always picture when we picture the helmets is like fancy feathers and high helmets. And the truth is those were actually set aside for commanders or centurions. And they would actually wear those helmets and they were actually made taller to make them look taller so that the enemy's like, oh, that's a big dude. Come on, every, all the men under six foot say amen, all right? Go rock the high helmets, come on. Some of y'all pop the hat on. We're like, your head is not that tall. <laughs> That's enough, okay. But these helmets were designed like bicycle helmets. They had padding inside of them so that if a soldier took a blow to the head, he would be okay. See, when we choose to wear the helmet of salvation and you know who you are in Christ, when you wear that helmet of salvation, it protects your mind from the lies, doubt, deception, and toxic thinking that the enemy tries to place there. 
This is one of Satan's greatest weapons because he's the father of lies. He's the architect of lies. He will attempt, he will attempt every day to fill your mind with rationalizations of why you can sin and why you can live on the edge and why it's okay to do this because he can convince you, ah, it's not that bad. Like, it's not that bad. Other people are way worse than you, right? I've said this a lot. I preach this a lot. Sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, cost you way more than you want to spend. But if you get it set in your mind and you're not guarding your thoughts, you start, you start making excuses and you start saying like, yeah, I get it, but like, I, you don't know, but like, I, I, I love the Lord and like, I've got a relationship with God and you try to dance on the edge. We talked about this in a sermon called The Cost of Compromise where Lot ended up placing his life near Sodom and everything fell apart in one chapter later. It said that he placed his life near Sodom. And in chapter 14, Abram sending in 318 men to rescue him because he was living in Sodom. What you find yourself near, you will find yourself in. And so living this way and not guarding your thoughts and not guarding your mind, because the reality is what you think you'll end up saying, and so goes the trajectory of your life. But the same is true when you wear the helmet of salvation. And you allow the Holy Spirit to say, hey, 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 that's not the way we live. No, 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 no. That's things that you used to deal with. Flee from youthful passions and pursue my righteousness. Because again, when you change the way you think, it will change what you say and ultimately change the trajectory of your life. Somebody say amen. But the enemy will attempt to fill your head with lies. He'll also try to get you to think that God doesn't love you, that what you've done is so far gone. I said this a few weeks ago. Like, I hate to break the news to you, but you're not that good at sinning. So far, like, I'm so far away from God that no way he'll love me. That's not what the Bible says. Think about the prodigal son who came back and his father threw him a party. We say this all the time, that Jesus is just one mention of his name away from being right there again. And when you put on the helmet of salvation, you recognize that through God's grace, that this isn't about fiction, it's about facts and truth. The helmet of salvation gives us a confidence in Christ that we have been saved because of the price that Jesus Christ paid for us on the cross. Come on, if you're grateful for grace, for all the goof ups and mercy for all the mistakes and the unfailing love that should have ran out on you, we should give him praise. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says it this way, we must take captive every thought. That's a choice. Anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, we have to grab that and say, no, 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 no. I'm gonna redirect this back to God because I am what the word says I am. I am who God says I am. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So when the enemy starts lying to you and saying, hey, you're gonna be broke as a joke like your family, I doubt that because my God supplies every need according to his riches and glory and everything I put my hand to prospers. Well, you're going to get sick with this disease because it runs in your family genes. And then I, here's what the Bible says about me, that just as sure as the sun will rise, Isaiah 58, 8, that my strength and health will spring forth speedily. The righteousness of God goes out in front of me and the glory of the Lord has my rear guard. He's had my back. He has my now and he has my next. When you're guarding your mind, you begin to speak the word. Again, it'll change the way you think which will change what you say. And you believe you more than you believe anything that anybody says about you. So if God doesn't say it about you, stop saying it over yourself. And you're so stupid. No, you're not. You're creative. You're brilliant. Come on, start speaking live. Oh, you're one of those blab it and grab it preachers. Now I'm a Job 22, 28 preacher that says when I decree a thing, it shall be established. Come on, everything we put our hands to is blessed. I walk in favor. When I walk in rooms, doors open and doors close that should close. Doors fling open if I'm supposed to be in that room. Come on, somebody. This isn't a blabber or grab it. This is a Bible. So when we have the word hidden in our hearts and we know the word through memorization, we're going to unpack this a little bit more when it comes to using the sword of the spirit. But Colossians 3, 2 says this, set your minds on things above not on earthly things. How many of y'all have ever tried on a hard hat? Come on. Like, like you just walk in somebody's office, you're like, what is that? <laughs> Can I try that on? <laughs> We're gonna be breaking ground here soon with the new building, and so we have to wait. Yeah, yeah, amen. You can shout. 
And so we're going to have to be out there with hard hats on. And ladies, the reason why men are not going to live as long as you is because anytime a dude puts on a hard hat, if there's an object around, we're going to hit him on the head with it. Come on, whether it's a yardstick, I don't care if it's a corn dog, like we are going to just... <laughs> And they're not even flinching. Why? Because they're wearing a hard hat. But if they didn't have the hard hat on, they'd be ducking and weaving and moving around like, bro, don't hit me with that. Don't, don't hit me with that. Because the hard hat protects the head. It helps the men or women who's at the job site focus better when you have a hard hat on. Same goes with our relationship and the relationship between the helmet and the sword. The helmet, which is the confident assurance of grace and salvation that surrounds our Mind and also protects our hearts because sometimes when we don't understand grace, I'll be honest, in my humanity, like, really? This undeserved grace, literally, that none of us deserve, he so freely gave it to us by swapping his life for ours and paying the ultimate price on the cross. When we don't fully understand grace, what ends up happening in our humanity is we run from the Bible. Why? Because we don't feel worthy. Or you allow condemnation to kind of be thrown like one of those weighted blankets that Pastor Jackie tries to hold me down with. <sighs> this is an intervention. Stop doing it. Okay? I'm a little upset, too, because last week when she preached and we were out in the lobby, three of you. I'm not going to, one of them's in the room. I'm not going to make eye contact with you. They're like, Pastor Daniel, do you think it's time maybe for you to go back to music and let her preach more? How many of y'all want to hear Pastor Jackie preach more often? She's amazing. <laughs> Anyways, when, con when condemnation creeps in and you wear that thing around like an ill-fitting jacket, what ends up happening is you'll run from God. Why? Because again, you don't feel worthy. But when you have your mind surrounded in confidence and assurance of God's love and mercy and grace over your life, you'll stop running from the word of God. and You'll actually start running to the word of God. And you'll recognize, man, number two, write this down, that his word is our weapon. His word is our weapon. If the spirit realm's even more than the natural realm, his word is our weapon. And just like a real sword, we need to know how to use it. So we study it, we know how to apply it. Now, this sword that Paul was talking about, for those of you who are Bible nerds and you like to know these things, it wasn't like the big Braveheart sword. Like, that's crazy, where do they store that thing? Like, no, it was about 20 inches long and man, it was super sharp and all the other armor, again, was for protection. The sword was also for protection. but The sword was the offensive weapon in the arsenal so that we can attack the enemy. The sword was important to the survival of the soldier. It's how he was able or she was able to keep the enemy away. For us, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. If you're gonna live a victorious life, you need to carry the sword of the spirit. If you wanna defeat the enemy and survive and thrive through life's battles, you have to know the word of God and know how to handle the sword of the spirit. Y'all, the word of God is powerful. The writer of Hebrews Chapter four, verse 12 tells us this, for the word of God, it's on the screens, is alive, say it's alive, and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. In the book of Matthew, chapter four, when Jesus was led out into the, the desert and he was tempted by Satan, what weapon did Jesus use? Did he use philosophical arguments? No. Did he say, hey man, it's MMA time. It's Jesus versus you. Let's fight. No. No, what he did was, at every attempt of the enemy to deliver a blow, Jesus blocked the attack by quoting scripture. In every encounter, he went on the offense of speaking the word of God. Jesus used the sword of the spirit. And I don't know about you, if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. Amen. Look at the person next to you and say, if it was good enough for Jesus, it was good enough for me. Come on. But we have to apply it. We have to be in the word every day. We have to memorize God's word, speak God's word, listen to God's word. Again, his word doesn't return to him void. Sing out these worship songs where the lyrics are written out of God's word. We have to become familiar with the word of God because ultimately what ends up happening is we're storing away spiritual weapons for the spirit of God to use it's wild, whenever I have an opportunity to pray for somebody, 
I, I feel bubbling up out of me because when you're squeezed in life, what's hidden inside of you is what comes out of you. And so when you have the word and you've memorized the word, I'm really big on memorization and repetition of the word. Uh, when I was younger, uh, in, in, um, as a kid growing up, and then I, under my first pastor, he talked to me about remembering reference and verse. I've talked about this before, but I stole some of my mom's recipe cards, and I took a Sharpie, and with my own handwriting, I wrote out scriptures, and then I would recite them, and I would say, Psalms 23, 6 says, surely the goodness and mercy of God will follow me all the days of my life, and I would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Next one, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, those that wait, look for, expect, and hope in him will gain new strength and renewed power. And I would put little sub points and I begin to get that word in me. So now when I run into somebody, it's like, man, my life feels like it's falling apart. I say, listen, and out of, out of just the overflow of memor memorizing the word of God and wearing the armor of God, what happens is the Holy Spirit will bring it to you because it's in your spiritual arsenal. It's in your weaponry. Come, somebody say weaponry. Come on. <laughs> He'll bring to your mind these passages which apply to the situation you're facing or someone else. Your mind will be trained to think like God thinks. And then you'll be able to pierce through lies and the deceptions of the enemy. Jesus knew the word of God. So he was able to not only defend but attack the devil using the scriptures to attack and drive the enemy away. Come on, somebody say amen. How about the other person on your other side and say you have to apply it every single day. So speaking of applying it, I feel like sometimes when we hear about the sword of the spirit, we almost think about the armor of God like an accessory. Like it's in the closet collecting dust and you're like, man, I'm in a bind. I should probably put on this <laughs> armor of God. And we almost treat the sword of the spirit like a pocket knife of power. Now, for those of you who don't know, I always carry this pocket knife. And a friend of mine gave me this. He's a Navy SEAL. And he said, y'all, this patented quick flip technology. Which y'all know about that. It's an underwater demolition knife. It's amazing. It's waterproof. I've never had it under the water. I did cut an apple once. I had to rinse it off. Some of you are like, it's pretty aggressive. Do you think I use this knife, the patented quick flip technology, for what it's used for? No, I don't. When I flip this thing out, I'm trying to flick a pit out of a peach. That's what I use this for. <laughs> or if you were here last week, I, I just used this recently to cut the tags off those high-waisted pants that Pastor Jackie accidentally bought <laughs> that some of y'all thought I was going to wear this week. It buttoned up here. So I had to cut the tag off. Have I, have I ever used this pocket knife, this accessory more than just keeping it on my right here or in my bag. This is the way we treat the sword of the spirit. We kind of keep it tucked away like it's an accessory. Well, I need the word of God. Why? Because I'm under attack. Have I used this at the full capacity? No. Unless you throw a peach at me. And now I'm pretty good. I'm pretty kung fu on this thing. I'm telling you. No, but the truth is when we look at the word of God, if we dumb it down to just being a book we read, or the armor of God is just fiction, the sword of the spirit is an accessory, and we don't recognize that the sword of the spirit is actually for taking ground. It's for pushing back against darkness and the devil's schemes. It's for daily use to build daily strength. It's for cutting back the lies of the enemy. And here's the good news about the armor of God. Number three, if you're taking down notes, notes you can wear it and it won't wear out. You can wear it every day and it won't wear out. How many of y'all are creatures of habit? Like you have your work clothes and as soon as you get home, you have like that one, you know, two or three t-shirt combo. Come on, wave at me. Some of you are like, that's gross. I switch it up. <laughs> so I'm a creature of habit. I go back to these one Hope City shorts that I like. And then I have a handful of t-shirts that you know are super thick. They've like worn down. They're comfortable around the house. They're possibly a little appropriate if I'm wearing them outside. You know what I mean? Like, and so the other day I was like, babe, there's a hole in this. And she's like, there's a hole in it? The entire back is like lots of holes. <laughs> and I know that this, this combo, this shirt short combo has a limited life. Because we live on this earth where things fade away, including our mortal bodies. And I know it has a limited shelf life. I think it, I think those, I think it still has three to four years. That's just, <laughs> just so you know, you can count on it. I'm trying to pass it down. Amen. But the beautiful thing about the armor of God is you can wear it every day and it doesn't wear out. 
You can wear it every single day, put it on, and recognize that God won't disappoint and everything that he has given us access to through the ar armor we can absolutely walk in that. Now, he'll challenge our understanding. He'll challenge us daily and show us that he's consistent and constant. He'll show us that he's always faithful, but he's offering us an outfit. The one that we can say, thanks, my dad bought me this outfit. He's offering us a custom fit outfit for each and every one of us. It's his daughters and sons to wear every day. It's a choice. If you wanna move different, you have to act different. You have to change up your repetition and your patterns. That's why we talked about this 21 days of prayer and fasting. Now, let me say this. Some of you are like, thank God, I don't have to pray anymore. No, no, this is something we're gonna continue. <laughs> we're a church that prays. You can eat Blue Bunny ice cream. That's fine. But we're gonna pray as a church because here's the reality. Move different if you want different. Old keys don't unlock new doors. And what God wants to do in your life to close out this season of 2023, which we're still audacious enough to believe can end up the greatest year of our lives. That's what we believe. That even in the 11th hour, y'all, it might be New Year's Eve at 11.59 and say, my God, my check came in, amen. <laughs> no, but we're believing that we're gonna finish this year strong. We're not just gonna step into 2023. 2024 limping and hoping to have a successful year. No, we're going to go in with our armor on, filled up with the Holy Spirit, ready to take on whatever the enemy throws at us, knowing who we are and whose we are. Because the one standing with us will always be stronger than the one who's been standing against us. So we have six pieces of armor that we need to put on every single day. You can close your eyes for just a moment. God, thank you. Thank you for the armor that we have access to. Week one, I talked about how I asked the question, have you ever had access to something that you didn't access? I thank you, Lord God, throughout this series that you've reminded us of the access we have to these six pieces of armor, the feet of peace, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the helmet of salvation. God, every day, we're gonna apply this to our lives, not as an accessory, not as the pocket knife of power, but as the sword of the Spirit. Now, God, today I pray for every person, the sound of my voice, whether they're watching online, they're at Woodlands, Katy, here at West Houston, additional seating at one of our watch parties. If you're here today, or you're re-watching this replay, or you've stumbled upon this on YouTube or Facebook, you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I want to give two invitations, and then we're going to jump back into worship for a couple minutes, and then we're going to tie a bow on this and wrap up the series officially. But if you're here today and you would say, Daniel, here's the truth, man. I don't know Jesus as my Savior. I wish I did, but I don't. And I've been self-medicating with a lot of things in my life, and the truth is today I felt a tug in my heart. That was the nudge of the Holy Spirit saying there's more to life than the way you've been living it. And in just a moment, when I count to three, I want you to boldly lift up your hand, and we're gonna pray a prayer. Here at Hope City, we don't pray prayers just to pray them. This is not rituals. We don't do it out of tradition or religious experience. We pray because Romans 10, verse nine and 10 says, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. The second invitation is for those who maybe fell away. You're like, Pastor Daniel, when you mention the armor in the closet collecting dust, the truth is I used to walk with Jesus, but I've, I've fallen away. I've been living reckless. I've been living selfish. And today I want to come back home because what you're saying is that he's not mad at me, but he's madly in love with me. The truth is Jesus is just one mention of his name from being right there again. So one, I want to give my life to Jesus. Two, I want to rededicate my life. Three, if that's you, would you lift up your hand? I'm looking all over. I see you and you and you and you. I see you and you. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you and you and you and you. I see you. I see you. All the way in the back. I see you. Come on. I know hands are going up on all the other campuses. I see you, my friend. Come on. Can we give God praise for all of the folks that said, today's my day for the first time a rededication. Beautiful. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray. I want everybody to say this out loud. Say, Jesus, it's me. I've been living for me, and the truth is, it's not working. From today on, I'm choosing to live for you. I believe that you hung on that cross, traded your life for mine so that I could have freedom. 
So I repent for all my sin, all my struggles, all my issues, and I ask for your forgiveness. From this moment on, I'm going to live for you. You are my Father. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name.